Today, we will learn and reflect on slavery in the ancient world and the evolving attitudes and teachings on slavery in the Old and New Testament among the Stoic philosophers and the early church fathers. Though slaves were the employees of the ancient world, slavery was less brutal in ancient Israel and Judah than in Greece and Rome. In the Old Testament, there is not a clear distinction between servants and slaves. You may ask, how can we benefit from pondering this evolving attitude towards slavery in the ancient world? Although the Bible and Stoicism tolerated slavery as a labor system for the lower classes, they both encouraged society to view both slave and free as equal before God, and taught that all men should be treated with dignity and respect. After the Roman Empire became a Christian empire, the teachings of the church fathers became more critical of slavery. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources used for this video and my blogs that also cover this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Sometimes these generate short videos of their own. Let us learn and reflect together. Throughout the Torah and the Old Testament, Yahweh, time and time again, reminds his people, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Our paintings and thumbnail show how God delivered the Jews from slavery uh, to the Pharaoh, how Yahweh parted the waters of the Red Sea so the Israelis to, could cross, and how his servants Moses and Charlton Heston led the Israelites through the Red Sea to safety from the chariots of the armies of the Pharaoh. Scriptures recognize how slavery can kill the spirit and the soul of the slave. Yahweh in Exodus exhorts, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be their slaves no more. I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. And also throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh constantly reminds his people, Israel, the alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you too were aliens in the land of Egypt. For I am the Lord your God. Throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites are constantly reminded how they are obligated to love and help and be kind to the slave, to the sojourner, to the alien, to the immigrant, to widows, to orphans, to the poor, to the sick. For once they were slaves and aliens in the land of Egypt. Every year the Jews are reminded of the covenant they formed with Yahweh and they are exhorted that they are to love God and love their neighbor as themselves, for the angel of death passed over their houses on the first night of Passover in Egypt, bringing death to the firstborn of those who do not love the Lord. Slavery in the ancient world was not based on race like the Confederate South. When a city was defeated in the ancient world, the women and children were often enslaved, the men were often slaughtered, although sometimes the men were enslaved to work in the mines, which was a death sentence. In this respect, warfare might have not been quite as brutal in the Near East as it was for the Greek and Roman cultures. However, after the establishment of the monarchy by King David, some scholars believe that the Jewish army also enslaved women and children when they defeated neighboring cities, as was customary in ancient warfare in general. Scripture suggests that when Babylon conquered Judah, the prosperous Jews were forced into exile in Babylon. Although they were enslaved as a people, the Jews of Babylon lived in communities of their own and were permitted to worship Yahweh. Perhaps few, if any, Jews were enslaved to individual Babylonians. Likewise, scriptures hint that the Assyrians allowed the Jews to be exiled in Assyria as a community when they were defeated in war, but history is mostly silent about these ten lost tribes. Maybe many were enslaved to individual Assyrians, since they are assimilated and culturally disappeared, we just don't know. We don't know that much about their fate. In our first video on slavery in the ancient world, we reflected on this history of slavery in ancient Greece and Rome. There are many similarities, plus more differences, on how slavery developed in Greece and Rome and in ancient Israel and Judah. Let us look first at the broad categories of slaves. 
Although the Bible does not specifically condemn slavery, the Bible does encourage us to treat all of our fellow men with dignity and respect, whether they are slave or free. Due to the geography and culture of ancient Israel and Judah, slaves were not as numerous as they were in Greece and Rome. Most of the slaves are servants of ancient Israel and Judah, and it was difficult to distinguish between slaves and servants, were household slaves who assisted with farm work also. The household servants in the Old Testament were often seen as part of the family and often had a higher status than the household slaves of Greece and Rome. For example, Abraham trusts his oldest servant, Eliezer, with a camel loaded with dowry goods to cross the desert to the tent of his cousin Laban, and he trusts his servant to return with Laban's virtuous daughter, Rebekah, to wed his son Isaac. This servant, Eliezer, was also at one time heir to the house of Abraham before he was supplanted by the birth of Isaac. Another example is Jacob, who bore his twelve children through both his wives and through their handmaidens, who were also servants. This was a common practice among the patriarchs. Concubines were also a type of slave in both Israel and Judah, both consenting and unwilling, often captured in war. Uh, concubines acquired as slaves was common in ancient Israel and Judah. We read in Exodus that near the end of his life, Jacob withholds his blessing from his son Reuben because he disrespected his father by sleeping with his main concubine. And you ask the question of how many concubines did Jacob have? We really don't know. The scriptures are silent on this question. The Torah and the Old Testament also have laws regarding the proper treatment of concubines captured during war by Jewish soldiers. As we discussed in our video on concubines and the Iliad in the Torah, these concubines were to be treated with the respect due to any other Jewish wife as much as possible. We also have some passages from Hosea that shed light on concubines and slavery in ancient Israel and Judah. And we read, The Lord said to Hosea, Go take for yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom for, by forsaking the Lord. And so then Hosea married Gomer. And the Lord instructed that he name their children Hebrew names that translate as God sows, not pitied, and not my people. And we wonder how happy Gomer was about these names. Were the kids happy with those names? I really don't know. But Gomer, like Israel, is unfaithful. Gomer has many lovers, and Israel worships many gods. So Hosea married Gomer. And the book of Hosea describes both infidelity of Gomer to Hosea and Israel towards Yahweh. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better with me than now. After his wife Gomer leaves Hosea to move in with the lovers, all does not go well. Like the prodigal son, she squanders what little money she has, until she is compelled to sell herself into slavery to pay her debts. But Yahweh instructs Hosea that he must redeem his unfaithful wife Gomer, just as Yahweh redeems his unfaithful bride Israel. The Lord said to me again, Go love a woman who has a lover and is an adulteress, just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bought Gomer for fifty shekels of silver and a homer of barley and a measure of wine. Then I said to Gomer, You must remain as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore. You shall not have intercourse with a man, nor I with you. The book of Hosea indeed teaches us many moral lessons, but it also reveals that in ancient Israel there were organized slave markets, and that they sold young women who could be forced to become concubines to their masters, and that debt slavery was common. We also sense that Hosea is more than a little bit upset at Gomer, and he just refuses to treat her like she was a concubine, or even a wife after her continued infidelity. But Hosea ends in a note of hope for Israel, and perhaps also for Gomer, in time. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who is torn, and he will heal us. For he has struck us down, and, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, on the third day he will raise us up, so that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. 
His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. In ancient Israel and Judah, there were few, if any, slaves in the harsher categories here. There were few large cities that employed slaves. There were likely few, if any, mines. And since Israel and Judah were mountainous, there weren't any large plantations as there were near Rome. There's no mention of slaves working as skilled craftsmen in the Bible, but we know even less of the lives of ordinary people in ancient Israel than we do for ancient Rome and Greece. We reflected on the book of Ruth in our video on St. Augustine, uh, the Stoic Rufus and Concupiscence. In that video, we learned that during the harvest, Ruth gleaned wheat from the fields of her future husband Boaz. At least in this community, there were no large plantations and no mentions of chain gangs of slaves. We can surmise that servants helped harvest the fields, along with laborers hired for the harvest. And to emphasize that slavery was less brutal in ancient Israel and Judah, we have laws in the Torah that regulated slavery. The Jews were constantly reminded that they, they were once slaves in Egypt, with, which helped ensure that they respected the dignity of slaves, servants, aliens, and exiles. There was also a jubilee system. Jewish slaves had to be freed in the seventh year of their captivity. Also, if a master significantly injured a slave, then the slave would be set free. This is unheard of in the ancient world. Also unheard of, masters were forbidden to murder their slaves. And the Torah establishes cities of refuge for runaway slaves from the surrounding countries and cities. Slavery was abolished by the prophets after the destruction of the Temple of Solomon per the Jewish Encyclopedia. Now we will shift our focus to the Roman Empire in the evolving attitude of both Christians and the Stoic philosophers towards slavery. Early Christians were a small minority in the Roman Empire. They were not in a position to challenge the institution of slavery, and Christians like the Old Testament prophets sought instead to improve the conditions of slaves and encourage Christians to regard slaves and freemen as equal before Jesus. Likewise, the Stoic philosophers were also not eager to challenge the social order, but did encourage better treatment of slaves. St. Paul may have been concerned that Christians might face official resistance if they even hinted that slavery was contrary to Christian values. These cautions he raised with Timothy. Let all those who are under the yoke of slavery regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and uh, the teaching may not be blasphemed. Paul also exhorts us in Galatians, There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Also, and because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. In 1 Corinthians, St. Paul says, All are free before Christ. Were you a slave when you were called? Do not be concerned about it. Even if you gain your freedom, make use of your present condition now more than ever. For whoever was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed person belonging to the Lord, just as whoever was free when called is a slave of Christ. You are bought with a price. Do not become slaves of human masters. And whatever conditions you are called, brothers and sisters, there remain with God. We are arguing in these videos that slavery in the ancient world was merely a labor system under which the lower classes of society labored, and that ancient slaves were the employees of the ancient world. This interpretation can assist us when applying the advice of the New Testament to our daily lives. Anyone who has work experience knows that if you ignore your boss's instructions, you are likely to be terminated. Perhaps the only difference between slaves and employees is employees can choose their master, quitting jobs they feel are intolerable. In his lectures on Ephesians, the late Dr. James Boyce suggests that the section on slaves and masters applies to a today's situation of employees and employers. How does this work? In Ephesians, let us simply replace the word slave with employee and master with the word manager and see what St. Paul and Ephesians can teach us today. And with a substitution, Employees, obey your earthly managers with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as you obey Christ, 
not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as employees of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are employees or managers. And managers, do the same to your employees. Stop threatening them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. That does sound pretty good. Also included in the New Testament is the book of Philemon. In that book, a slave had escaped from an acquaintance of St. Paul and visits St. Paul in prison. Perhaps the slave had been mistreated. In this short epistle, St. Paul sends him back to his masters with instructions to the master to treat his slave as a brother in Christ. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you may have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Many people assert that the slavery in the Deep South was unique because it was race-based, especially when compared to Greek slaves. But this distinction should not be overdrawn, as the Greeks definitely saw slaves as belonging to an inferior social class and possessing an inferior character, as can be seen by the writings of Aristotle in the opening chapters of his work on politics. Here Aristotle asserts that a slave is a piece of property, which is animate, that slaves are born into slavery as opposed to slaves captured in war or by pirates, are by nature slaves, and natural slaves are similar in nature to tame animals. Here again, he's comparing slaves to cattle and sheep. But even for slaves captured in war, Aristotle asserts that no one would assert that a slave is unworthy to be a slave. Aristotle does not have a high opinion of slaves, or for that matter, women or children. And he says in politics, the slave has no deliberative faculty at all. The woman has, but it is without authority, and the child has, but it is immature. And also Aristotle says, A slave is useful for the wants of life, but only requires as much virtue as will prevent him from failing in his duty to his master through cowardice or lack of self-control. In contrast, the Roman Stoic philosophers agreed more with the Christians. They objected to masters mistreating or abusing their slaves. For example, once when Emperor Marcus Aurelius observed a nobleman abusing his slave, he forced the nobleman to sell his slave to him. Did Marcus Aurelius then free this aggrieved slave? Well, no, but he did resell the slave to a somewhat kinder master. And also the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, who himself was a former slave of a former slave, once noted that a tyrant could never completely enslave you. For even if the tyrant seized all you own, he can never steal your free will. He can never prevent you from choosing to lead a godly life. We have the curious example of the Cynic philosopher Diogenes of Sinope. In many ways, Cynics were the predecessors of the Stoics. While he was traveling, Diogenes was captured by pirates and sold into slavery in Corinth. He told the slave master to announce that anyone who purchased him would be purchasing someone skilled at leading and that in his case the slave would be leading the master for anyone who purchased him. And surprisingly, he was purchased by Zeniades to assist him in raising and tutoring his sons. Diogenes taught the sons of Zeniades how to live on plain food and water, wear their hair short and unadorned, to go barefoot without a tunic, and to be silent and keep their eyes lowered when walking in the streets. Zeniades was so grateful for his services that he told his neighbor, a kindly deity has entered my house. When the friends of Diogenes offered to ransom him from his servitude to Zeniades, Diogenes refused, saying that lions are not the slaves of those who feed them. It is the feeders, rather, who are the lion slaves. For fear is the mark of a slave, but wild beasts make men fearful. So we see that both Epictetus and Diogenes, although they were slaves themselves, do not oppose slavery, but seek to demonstrate how we can live godly lives with purpose regardless of our circumstances, even if our circumstances are challenging. These two philosophers are living examples of the slaves 
who labor as if Christ were their masters in St. Paul's Epistle of the Ephesians. In contrast, the wealthy Seneca, who owned many slaves, urges us to treat slaves as our equals rather than our inferiors. He penned a letter on masters and slaves where he counseled that masters should treat their slaves more like acquaintances than as inferiors. His comments in this letter are echoed by later church fathers whose teachings we will examine shortly. We are quoting from Seneca's letter at length for his valuable advice on how we should treat anyone who is not our social equals according to our cultural norms. Seneca reminds us that we should love all men as ourselves for all men are our equals, all men are our neighbors. And Seneca on Master and Slave. Seneca tells his friend, I am glad to learn that you live on friendly terms with your slaves. But they are slaves, people say. No, they are unpretentious friends. They are our fellow slaves. If we reflect that fortune affects both slaves and free alike. That is why I smile at those who think it is degrading for a man to dine with his slave. Why is that? Only because a purse-proud etiquette surrounds a housekeeper at his dinner with a mob of attending slaves. I shall pass over other cruel and inhuman conduct towards our slaves, as if not as if they were men, but if they were beasts of burden. Then Seneca mentions how slaves are often forced to clean up after their masters, who spend nights of too much food and booze and vomit and debauchery, degrading themselves more than their slaves. Seneca continues, Kindly remember that he who you call your slave sprang from the same stock, is smiled upon by the same skies, and on equal terms with yourself, breathes, lives, and dies. It is just as possible for you to see in him a freeborn man as for him to see in you a slave. Seneca proposes a golden rule for masters. Treat your inferiors as you would wish to be treated by your betters. Reminding his reader how many were sold into slavery by misfortune, including King Croesus in Herodotus' history, or the mother of Darius when Alexander the Great conquered Persia, or the Agenes of Sinope. Associate with your slave unkindly, even on affable terms. Let him talk with you, plan with you, live with you. I know many of you will cry out, There is nothing more debasing, more disgraceful than this. Do you mean to say, comes the retort, that I must seat all my slaves at my table? No, not any more than you should invite all free men to your table. You are mistaken if you think I would bar from my table certain slaves whose duties are humbler, like muleteers or herdsmen. I propose to value them according to their character and not according to their duties. Each man acquires his character for himself, but accident assigns his duties. Invite some slaves to your table because they deserve the honor, and other slaves that they may come to deserve your honor. But you say, he is a slave. His soul, however, may be that of a free man. Show me a man who is not a slave. One man is a slave to lust, another to greed, another to ambition, and all men are slaves to fear. You should respect your slave. Respect means love, and love and fear cannot be mingled. Only dumb animals need the thong. In succeeding centuries, as Christianity grew in numbers and eventually became the state religion for Emperor Constantine and his heirs, several early church fathers either condemned the institution of slavery or tried to weaken its grasp. First we have the Didache. It teaches us never to speak sharply when giving orders to domestic servants whose trust is in the same God as yours. Otherwise, may they may cease to fear him who is over you both. The church fathers, like the Stoic philosophers, became more sympathetic to the plight of slaves as time passed. St. Gregory of Nyssa re reaffirms this passage, teaching us further that God creates humanity for no other reason than his innate goodness, and that all men equally bear in themselves the divine image. Also, the apostolic constitutions do not regard slavery as a natural condition. The freeing of slaves is encouraged, and when a slave owner frees his slaves, this was seen as a type of forgiveness of sins. Furthermore, St. Gregory of Nyssa teaches us, Among the vanities listed in Ecclesiastes are an expensive home, many vineyards, lovely gardens, pools, and orchards. Here we also find the man who regards himself as Lord over his fellow man, for he writes, I obtained servants, maidens, slaves born to me in my house. 
Can you see here that pride that originates false pretensions? This kind of person gives himself power over the human race as if he were its Lord. Like a sinner and a rebel against the divine commandment, you have put man himself under the yoke of servitude when he was created as Lord over the earth. You have forgotten the limits of your authority, which consists in dominions only over the brutish animals. How can you say that you have servants and maidens as if they were goats or cattle? St. Gregory's mentor, Bishop Eustathius, encouraged a monasticism of simple living that renounced degrees of rank and privilege. And this radical teaching led to a synod being called that expressed concern that monasteries might tempt monastics to abandon their worldly responsibilities as husbands or slaves. St. Ephraim is more sympathetic. He suggests that slaves should be freed when they join a monastery. This issue was addressed in the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, whose canons permitted a slave to become a monk with permission of his master. And if a runaway slave became a monk and was not detected for a year, then he would be free. This demonstrates the evolution of the teaching of the church regarding slavery. St. John Chrysostom was known for scolding the rich for their oppression of those who were poor. He asks the rich, why do you keep so many slaves? We should dress and eat only according to our need. What is the need for slaves? We have no need at all. One master should only employ one servant. For God made everyone well capable of attending to themselves and to their neighbor as well. That is why God gave us hands and feet in the first place, so that we may not stand in need of servants. You see, the class of slave was not introduced out of any perceived need. Otherwise, when Adam was made, slaves too would have been formed. No, it is the penalty of sin and disobedience that accounts for the introduction of slaves. St. John Chrysostom teaches that we should care for the welfare of our slaves. If you have any care for your slaves, do not employ them in serving your own needs. Rather, when you have purchased them, then teach them trade so they can support themselves, and then set them free. Likewise, modern-day employers should be sure that their employees have the training they need so they are always employable. St. John Chrysostom continues, But if you scourge your slaves and put them in chains, this is not humane. McGuckin states that St. Augustine had a practical philosophy regarding slavery. St. Augustine teaches us that abolishing slavery, although it is a sinful alienation from the standards of love, would cause too much social unrest. In the present state of the world, it ought to be endured. This opinion was influential through the Middle Ages, but by his actions, St. Augustine showed that slavery should be resisted. Since many slaves were captured by pirates, St. Augustine once encouraged his congregants to free the slaves on a transport ship that mistakenly docked in the local harbor. But St. Augustine did not condone his enemies, the Donatists, when they torched slave-owning plantations, freeing the slaves. In the City of God, St. Augustine restates the instructions of St. Paul in Ephesians. This is the origin of domestic peace and the well-arranged concord between those in the family who rule and those who obey. For it is the ones who care for the rest who rule, the husband over the wife, the parents over the children, and the masters over the servants. Even so, in the family of a just man who lives by faith, even those who rule are servants of those whom they seem to command. But then St. Augustine specifically condemns slavery. He teaches us that the condition of slavery is the result of sin. That is why we do not find the word slave in any part of scripture until Noah branded the sin of his son with this name. Slavery, therefore, is introduced to the world by sin and not by nature. In Latin, the word for slave stands for POWs, who are afterward called servants. But these circumstances could have never arisen except as a result of sin. Kenneth Harrell, a professor of many Great Courses lecture series, uh, states that after the decline of the Roman Empire, the supply of new male slaves was cut off from the Great Plantations that employed vast slave gangs that over the course of many centuries in Europe, the Roman system of slavery evolved into the system of serfdom in medieval Europe, although history is silent on exactly how and when this transition occurred. McGuckin speculates that the evolving teaching of the church on the evils of slavery helped the evolution of serfdom by the 7th century. Serfdom was like slavery in that the serfs were bound to the landed estate in which they were born, 
which is not that big a deal in medieval Europe because it was not safe to travel. Serfs were permitted to have a home life with stable families. They were no longer chattel property and could not be bought or sold. And now we will discuss the sources we used for this video. Of course, the major source is the Old and New Testament. Most of the excellent material on slavery in the Bible, in the writings of the Church Fathers, is from John Anthony McGuckin in The Path of Christianity, the First Thousand Years. McGuckin has several chapters in this book on how the Bible and the Church Fathers responded to various social issues that were encountered in the ancient world that are useful today. We have also consulted the social world of ancient Israel and life in biblical Israel. They do not have a detailed discussion of slavery as it was not as well developed in ancient Israel and Judah as it was in Greece and Rome. Uh, we have also mentioned the late James Boyce sermons on Ephesians. Some of his sermons were available on the internet at the time we recorded this video. They are well worth listening to. Please click on the links below for our blogs on slavery in the ancient world. And please click on the links for interesting videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.